Okay, we're live. Good afternoon, CS109. How are you guys doing today? Let's try that again. It's a Friday. How are you guys doing? Yay! <laughs> um, I appreciate, like, you know, what are we, week four? I think we're week four. It's, like, a little bit harder to, like, <laughs> midterms are coming around the quarter. Speaking of which, we have our midterms not next week, but the week after in CS109. And the one big announcement for that is please do fill up that form to let us know if you're going to take it on a Tuesday or Wednesday. We need to make sure that we have enough seats, uh, and that will depend on how many people are showing up on each day. So you're doing us a huge favor, so absolutely, if you could please fill out that form. Okay. Um, and we have a wonderful class today. We're going to be learning about inference, how we're going to change our beliefs in the face of new information. What an incredibly important thing to know how to do uh, with random variables, and we're going to learn how to do it today. Uh, it's a Friday. So I thought I would tell you guys a story. Let's see. I told you guys a story of how my parents met. And normally I say this for the end of the quarter, but I was going to start telling you guys about how I met my wife, because I love lower stories. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll tell you guys a little bit about this. And it's kind of interesting because, you know, I'd like to tell you about stories that have taken place since then. So I met my wife not during my co-term year, but in the year after my co-term. So I did a co-term at Stanford, and then after I finished my co-term, I'm like, I'm done, I'm out of here. I took an entire year off. I got into a PhD program, I was like, don't call me for you know, 365 days. Uh, and in that time, I went back to Kenya, which was lovely, and I spent a few months there. And at some point, I decided, I had this great idea. I was like, in a whole year, I was gonna slowly make my way back to campus. Uh, and so I started traveling, and I made it all the way to Greece. But it was 2011, and there was a, economic crisis in Greece, and I was on a ferry, and the ferry conductor says, wherever you get off, you're not leaving because there's not going to be a ferry for several weeks. Uh, so I chose an island, uh, and uh, it turns out that my wife-to-be also got stuck on the same island for similar reasons. Uh, and because there was no way on or off, and it was a small island, we kept running into each other. Like, we just met each other. I was sitting on a wall, and she's like, this is a nice view, and I'm like, yeah. And we had the most wonderful two-minute conversation. But then the person I was waiting for came and we we're supposed to go for a walk. And then my wife, now wife, was like, can I come with you? And the person who I met was like, no. <laughs> and that could have been the end of the story, but since we were stuck on the same island, we saw each other uh, a few times. <laughs> and like we were running to each other and be like, hey, I remember you. Um, but then one day the strikes ended. The, there was ways off the islands and we went different directions. And I genuinely thought I would never see this person again. Until a few days later, I'd made my way to Athens. I got a, a message, and it says, Hi, Chris, you know, I was thinking about it. It's really nice to meet you. I'm going to be in northern Romania in like three days. Come join, or two days. And I was like, oh, that sounds really exciting, but there's no way I can cross so much of Europe in just two days. Um, I couldn't afford the flight because I didn't have that much money. Um, I couldn't afford a train, and a bus was too slow to get me there in time. And that could have been the end of the story, but somebody, this is a bad idea, don't do this at home, convinced me that hitchhiking was a reasonable thing. And they sent me to like AthensHitchhiking.com where it had like step-by-step -step instructions on how to do it. It's like you get a sign and you stick your thumb out. And they tell you where to go. And I went there and nothing. Three hours just standing on the side of a highway and be like, what am I doing with my life? Um, but then at some point, a motorcyclist took me a little bit further and then a car took me a little bit further and then another car took me a little bit further and I was really stuck in the middle of nowhere and now when I was there for three hours, I was like, this could be dangerous. Um, but I was at a rest stop and a truck pulled in and he went to sleep and three hours later when the truck driver woke up, I put my little sign up and he opened his door and he said, come on in and he gave me a long ride and the most wonderful thing happened. It was like an eight-hour ride, and I fell asleep, which I could have died. But instead of dying, <laughs> he woke me up. And he was like, Chris, while you're asleep, I called all my friends, and I told them the story. I told him I was going to go meet this girl I met, which he liked. Uh, and he said, I told all my friends, and tonight you're going to come to my house. We'll feed you. We'll give you clothes. Or we'll clean your clothes. I'm like, hey, I'm pretty clean. But, um, and then we'll get you. We'll, all my friends are going to pitch together. We'll buy a flight so you can make it there on time. And this is a stranger who's already doing a nice thing for me. In the moment of a crisis, like he must have felt some fear for what this crisis is going to mean for him. 2011 was a pretty serious crisis for Greece. And he was just so generous. And it's hard to name something that was so generous uh, in my life. Of course, I said no, though, because even though I didn't have very much money, that was too much for me to accept. 
So what he did instead is he snuck 20 euros into my backpack, but more importantly, he set me up with his friends. So like when I got off, another friend took me and then they would call ahead and I got like a chain of four trucks that got me all the way to Northern Romania. And I remember like, I don't know, it's like 22 years old. And I walk across into Bulgaria in the middle of night in like late October around this time of year. Uh, and this truck pulls up, it's like, are you Chris? I'm like, yes. It's like, are you gonna go meet? I'm like, yeah, that's me. <laughs> and I just got in this person's truck. Um, anyways, I'll tell you the rest of the story over, uh, over another Friday, but um, we'll leave that as a little bit of suspense for now. Um, but we know how it ends. <laughs> um, but the details are worth recounting. Also worth recounting is today's topic. We're gonna to learn such a crazy cool idea. I split this amazing idea into two lectures and I did restructure CS109 a little bit because when I thought about it, I was like, this is one of those 10 out of 10 things you really, really want to know deep in your veins when you walk out of CS109. So I slowed down a little bit so that I can give you guys this pretty hard idea in two different lectures. So you guys are gonna be putting on your pretty hard thinking hats today and we're gonna see if we can work through this idea of inference. And inference is a very formal name for if you see evidence, how do you change your PMF or your PDF of a random variable? Not just your belief in an event, but the entire PDF. And that's what we call inference, fancy name for a uh, relatively straightforward concept. And as always, I've gotten in the habit, this is the first quarter I've really done this, of putting all the questions for the lectures uh, into the PSET app, and you can find them on the course website. But by this point in the course, you probably know that. Where are we? We're in the part of the class where we're talking about multiple random variables being random together. Uh, in particular, I wanna give you an idea of where are we locally and what are we going to do in the world of probabilistic models? First, we introduce the concept of many, random, many variables being random together through the world of discrete models. So many random variables that can just take on discrete values themselves. We learn about joints, in particular joint probability tables, and then we are introduced to our first joint model called the multinomial. Today we're gonna to learn inference. Uh, and inference is the task of how do you change a random variable's belief in a probabilistic model when you see observations? But the other task that you're going to learn in this section is we're gonna do a little bit of modeling. How could you create your own probabilistic model? Uh, and then finally, I'm going to teach you a really cool randomized algorithm that you can use for solving inference problems for any probabilistic model. Uh, so that's our journey and it starts well, on Wednesday, and it continues with inference today. Some learning goals. We're going to continue our conversation about the multinomial. I hope by the end of today's class, you really appreciate the utility of log probabilities. Uh, and then finally, we're gonna really focus on improving your ability to combine Bayes' theorem with random variables, two great tastes that taste great together. There are a few things we're going to use today and here's one of them that you probably haven't seen and you probably haven't th thought of because it seems nonsensical. You wouldn't really use it in a probability problem, but sometimes it shows up in proofs. Recall when you have a continuous random variable, one of the ways of representing it is using this probability density function. Like this could be the probability density function of let's say an exponential random variable. And an exponential random variable can take on continuous values. We don't really think about the probability of it taking on one specific value as having too much meaning, right? Like what's the probability that the height of a baby is four pounds, point zero 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 zero, like to infinite precision? It doesn't have meaning because all babies will be slightly different than that number. No baby will be exactly equal to infinite precision. That still holds true, yet there is this one calculus intuition that I want to remind you of because we're going to use it in some proofs. If you ask about the probability of a baby being four to infinite precision zeros, it doesn't make sense. But if you allow for a range of values, you say like four plus or minus 0 0.01, that does make sense. You can say what's the probability that a baby's in that range. Does that make sense? So if you have a range, you get a probability. And so sometimes we think about the smallest range possible. And we call this the epsilon range. If you haven't seen epsilon before, we use it in mathematics to represent the smallest number possible. So the limit of a number as it goes towards zero. So you can take a density and multiply it by this epsilon. And you know, that is one very calculusy way to think about the probability that a continuous random variable takes on a value. 
I'm just going to plant this seed in your mind. We're going to use it again later, and then we'll revisit it. But I just want to start that idea germinating. To show you how you might use that particular idea, here's an interesting question. I'm going to say the time to finish a problem set is given by a Gaussian. Recall that a Gaussian is a continuous random variable. So if this is a Gaussian for how long it takes to finish problem set 3, uh, you could think about what's the probability density at, say, 10 hours or the probability density at 5 hours. The question I'd like to think about is, how much more likely are you to complete in 10 hours than in 5 hours? At first blush, you might think this is nonsensical because it's probability zero that you finish in exactly 10 hours and probability zero that you finish in exactly 5 hours. But it turns out in the limit, this zero or zero could be interpreted differently to give it some meaning. You could say, actually, I do think it's more likely to finish in 10 hours than 5 hours. You know, if you look at the Gaussian, at 10 hours, the PDF is much higher than at 5 hours. So how could we make sense of this statement in light of our idea that probability of x equals 10 is probably a zero number, and probably x equals 5 is also a zero number? Well, to better understand this, we can use that epsilon trick that we just talked about. We can say, this probably that x equals 10 is actually the density at 10 times by some really tiny range. I'm not going to specify how tiny the range is, but I want one that's really, really small. And I can do the same thing. Take the density at 5, so 5 hours to finish your problem set, and multiply it by the same width, tiny, tiny range. These epsilons are totally problematic. If they end up in the end of your answer, there's nothing you can do with this. It's polluted your answer. But they're helpful when they cancel. And as you can see here, by putting this epsilon range on the top, and putting this epsilon range on the bottom, I got meaningful statements. These epsilons are like infinitely small numbers, but they exactly cancel each other out. Which leads us to this question, which is hard to think about, is actually equal to just the ratio of the probability densities. That feels intuitive. It's saying the ratio of the probability density at 10 to 5 tells us how much more likely you are to complete at 10 hours than 5 hours. And at this point, we're going to use this beautiful equation that we've talked a lot about but haven't used yet. This is the normal probability density function. Looks rather scary, but it's just a beautiful probability density function equation. And I'm just plugging in 10, and we can use mu and the variance. We can plug in those numbers too. And eventually, once you plug in all those numbers, you end up with a reduction that goes, you know, e to the power of 0 divided by e to the negative 25 over 4, which is a 518. So we can give a semantic answer to how much more likely are you to complete a problem set in 10 hours than in 5. Is that a mind-blowing way to start a Friday or what? <laughs> so, you know, the, the long story short, there is this trick you can use. When you talk about the probability of a continuous random variable equaling a number, you can either think of that as just being zero, or you can think about it as the density times by the tiniest range possible. Questions, comments, concerns, arguments. Anyone have something they want to ask about this? Yes. What does the 518 represent again? It's saying this 518 is the ratio of these. So it's saying you're 518 times more likely to finish it in 10 hours than in 5 hours. So it gives you some idea that like this is this is much more likely according to this Gaussian. Okay. So it's it's certainly not a probability. It's a ratio of probabilities. It's saying, you know, how much bigger is this probability than that probability? Uh, some people will call that an odd, but we can talk about that another day. Yes? I thought in the past that probability, like the probability that X is to do something is like the PMF associated with that probability. Like, yeah. I thought it was just like probability of X equals 10 is equal to PMF of X equals 10. So ah. Where is that going? Okay. Good, good, good question. What you said is completely correct in the discrete case. So if x is a discrete random variable, like a binomial, how many, coin, how many heads do I get? Those are countable. It's discrete. It can be 1, 2, 3. And if you want to know the probability that x equals 10, you just look up in the probability mass function. 100% correct. In the continuous case, though, it's not just the probability mass function. Um, you can think of it as being very similar to the probability density function. That's really what's happening here. We're just using the ratio of the probability density functions. But probability densities are not probabilities, uh, and I just wanted to talk about that. So in a continuous case, when you say x equals 10, it's a much more complicated claim 
then saying a discrete thing is, takes on the value 10. Because in math, continuous things have infinite precision. Okay, as I said, this is just a warm up to an idea. I wanna let it germinate a little bit and we'll come back to this later when we talk about inference. We also talked about when random variables are random together. So we went, introduced ourselves to this concept on Wednesday and we thought about random variables being random together and we had this fun little example of two random variables. One random variable which is what year are you at Stanford and the other random variable represents, um, well in this case, I think we talked, oh yeah, we talked about uh, relationship status last time but here's a new data for some excitement. Uh, this is what is the room situation and this was collected a few years ago in CS109 anonymously. And so this, if you have these two random variables, the be all end all, the most useful thing you can have is what we call a joint distribution, which says, I have a way of telling the probability of any joint assignment to each of my random variables. So what's the probability that year is junior and two room double equals, or the, and the room type equals two room double. If you added up all these probabilities, they should be one. If you add up any row, you marginalize out the rooms and you're left with just the probability of the year. So this is probably freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, uh, five plus. Uh, and if you sum up the columns, you marginalize out the year and you're just left with the probability of somebody having roommates, two room doubles, a uh, shared partner, or a single. Okay, a little bit of review. Joint distribution, if you have a probabilistic model, if you have more than one random variable, this is the thing you really care about. It's the probability mass function equivalent for multiple random variables. And it's where you give me a statement which says, what's the probability of this particular assignment to my first random variable and this particular assignment to the other random variable? Remember this comma means and. Um, if you have more than two random variables, you know, you want to have uh, an ex expression that can tell you the likelihood of all those assignments happening at the same time. This joint distribution is important because if somebody gives me the joint, I can calculate any probability question anyone could ever want to know about my model. Notation, I just want to talk about it for a second. Hey, my slides are a little bit slower on here than on my computer. There you go. Notation, I don't want to lose anybody on this, but this shorthand becomes so common when you have multiple random variables that you need to know it. I will often try and use the top notation when I can, but often that's not possible if there's lots of random variables. The top expression says exactly what I want. What's the probability that this random variable equals this number and this other random variable equals this second number, little y? Where the little numbers, the little uh, y's represent that I expect you to put non-random values in there. That takes up too much space, so some people write it like this. And then other people are like, you know, the capital X kind of implies the lowercase x and the capital Y implies the lowercase y, so it's a bit redundant. What if we just wrote this and everyone can just know then we write this, we mean that. And it's like, what? This is like talking about the probability of constants, what are you doing? But that's the notation people often use. So if you see a probability like this, just know that it's implying a full probability statement that has proper events. And the proper events are quality events and the implied random variables are the capitals of what you see. Mind blowing. Okay, anyways, joints, they're really important. We had this problem though. We would start to represent probabilistic models with joint tables and that was a good time until we, started, until we started putting a couple random variables together. And once you had more than two random variables, we realized that the size of your joint table would grow exponentially. And that's a problem for representing a computer. It's also a problem for the scientists who are trying to come up with the probability values. So our solution was, are there ways we can model the world so that you can represent a joint without having to write a full uh, probability, or a joint probability table. Welcome the multinomial. Multinomial answered the question, if I were to roll n dice, where each dice has m different outcomes, what's the probability of seeing c1 outcomes of type one, c2 outcomes of type two, and cm outcomes of type m? This is naturally a probabilistic model because there are naturally multiple random variables that are being random together. How many outcomes of type one? How many outcomes of type two? to how many outcomes of type M. If it's a dice, there's six outcomes, and the probability of each outcome is one over six. But the multinomial can be more general. You can have more than six outcomes, and you can specify the probability of each outcome. Similar to the binomial distribution, a similar derivation leads to this beautiful equation 
where this is a constant. It's an uh, n choose uh, c1, c2, cm, which is the same as n factorial divided by this factorial, this factorial, this factorial. So that's a big old number multiplied by probability of outcome 1 to the power of how many times you saw outcome 1. This would let you do silly things with dice, with like saying, if I roll seven dice, what's the probability of seeing six ones and a two and zero of the other outcomes? But it allows us to do more interesting things. Particularly, we got into probabilistic text analysis. Probabilistic text analysis was, could model a document as a multinomial. We'd make a big dice, which was the author's probability of writing any particular word. So instead of having six sides, it has one side for every word the author could write. And the corresponding probability of that side was the probability the author would write that. And we imagine the creation of a document as the author just getting out their massive dice, rolling it, seeing which word came out, writing it, and rolling again, seeing which word came out, writing it down, and that's how the author produced the document. If you imagine that's how we get counts of words in a document, then it means that you can think about those counts of words using exactly the multinomial. End of review. That was a long way to get to the punchline that we all wanted to get to. Who wrote the Federalist Papers? So on Wednesday's class, we started writing this program to figure out, did Alexander Hamilton or Madison write Federalist Paper 53? I gave you data. I gave you samples of Madison's writing. I gave you samples of Hamilton's writing. From those things, you could calculate these two probabilities. For every word I, you can calculate the probability that Hamilton writes that word. It's just how many times it shows up in the sample divided by a number of words. And same thing with Madison. For any word I, where I could be like the, or Congress, or you know Chris, he doesn't write Chris, that's sad. Uh, MI would be the probability of Madison writing word I. These two documents allow you to get HI and MI. And this document is the Federalist paper we care about. And that Federalist paper, we can count how many times each word I appears. And we're going to call those CIs. And we decide we're going to use Bayes' theorem. We're going to say, we have counts of words. We know the probability of different authors writing different words. Uh, can we figure out who wrote this document? And we said, we can think of it like this. If I knew Hamilton was the author, it's easy to think about the probability of the counts of words. That's just a multinomial. This is a hard probability, but we can calculate it using Bayes' theorem using this easier one. It requires us to know probability of H and probability of T. Probability of H is how likely do we think Hamilton is to write this if we had no other information? And we're just saying that's one half. Um, and then probability of D was a problem. This thing on the bottom, we call it the normalization constant. It's a problem a lot of the time, so we have lots of tricks to deal with it. The particular, oh, and just, you know, want to point out that that's a multinomial, and we want to figure out what to do with this. The particular trick we wrote, we used, you can either see the slides, or I wrote it over here, is I wanted to get rid of the probability of D. I didn't want to calculate it. So I used this super crafty trick. Use it, learn it, show your friends. Probability of Hamilton given D is this expression. And the probability of Madison given D is the same expression, and both of them have this probability of D. And the super tricky ones out there might realize if you took this term and divide by this term, we could make those probabilities of Ds just go away. So you don't have to ever calculate it. Probability of D is a weird thing. We call it the normalization constant because it's a weird thing. and saying like, what's the probability of seeing these words without conditioning on who the author is. And it's really hard to think about the probability of seeing these words if you don't know who the author is. In both this term and M given, or D given M, we know who the author is. We've been told Hamilton or Madison are the authors. But if we write this out, check out what happens. This term is divided by D and this term is divided by D, so these two things just cancel out. Ah, what a good time. And it gets even better. We assume that before we see anything, any data, the probability of Hamilton is one half and the probability of Madison is one half. So these two terms just cancel out. Ah, oh, what good times. And you're like, does it get any better? And I tell you, it gets even better. Why does it get even better? This coefficient has to do with the counts of the words in the documents. You know, C1 is how many times word one shows up in the unknown document. And so is this C1. In fact, these two terms are exactly the same because they're both just 
an expression of the counts of the words in the exact same document. So lo and behold, these two terms just go away. Wait, <laughs> I forgot a product over here. <laughs> that would be funny. It's, we're gonna loop over all the words in the document. For every word, we're gonna say, what's the probability that Hamilton wrote that word? And we're gonna raise it to the power of how many times the word shows up. And this term is, for every word in the document, figure out the probability that Madison wrote the word, and then raise it to the probability, or the count of the number of times that it shows up. This led to this wonderful piece of code. Where, you know, I do some pre-processing on the text, and I calculate Hamilton word probabilities, those are all the HIs. I calculate Madison word probabilities, those are all the MIs, and I show you a lookup. I look up Congress, so it's like, where I is Congress, I look up Hamilton, uh, word probability, mass and word probability, and the counts. And then I calculate this term passing in the Hamilton Dictionary. And then I calculate this term passing in the Madison Dictionary. So here is passing the Hamilton Dictionary, that gives the Hamilton term. Calculate it with the Madison Dictionary, that gives the Madison term, and then I print those out. This equation, cheeky little bugger, does that. It starts with a probability of one, why one? If you multiply anything times zero, you'll get zero. So I start with a one, and then I'm gonna multiply these terms in one at a time. Remember, this is a for loop over products. So it's a for loop. If you haven't seen a for loop like this in Python, it says, take your dictionary of count items and give me one at a time which word was written and how many times it shows up. I look up in the dictionary what's the probability of the word I, and I raise it to the power of CI. So I do this computation, and I get a running product for probabilities. It seems so beautiful. Look, it's nicely commented. I use the snake case. What a good time to be alive. And we feel so good about ourselves um, until we run the code. HI, where I is Congress, is a number. It's a probability. MI, where I is Congress, is a number. It's a probability. CI, where I is Congress, is a count. It's how many times the word Congress shows up. Everything seems good except when we calculate these probabilities, they are zero. What could go wrong? Now, sometimes you just look at code and you know it. You're like, my soul speaks to me and I know exactly what the bug is. But other times we debug, maybe you use a debugger, or maybe you does a print line. So I'm like, what's going on here? I'm gonna print, like this for loop, it's continually updating a probability variable and I wanna print out that probability as we go. And look at what happens. Scrolling up, scrolling up, that's a lot of zeros. Oh look, first iteration, it's one. Second iteration, it's pretty small. Third iteration, it's about as small as you can imagine. This says 2.5 times 10 to the negative 309. That's tiny. And then after that, your computer's like, I can't even. I just can't even. I don't wanna talk about numbers smaller than 10 to the negative 309. What's going on here? Yeah, what's wrong? Oh man, computers and probability, you're so powerful together, but this is where you just can't get along. When you multiply these small numbers together, in theory, it makes sense. And when you divide it, you'll get a tiny, tiny number here. Like, this is a small number, multiplied by itself a bunch of times, multiplied by a whole bunch of other small numbers. This is a teeny, tiny, tiny number. And this is also a teeny, 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 tiny number. And in theory, dividing these te teeny, tiny numbers will give us our answer but the computer doesn't want to. <laughs> it can't represent numbers that small. So when you multiply probabilities against each other, especially small ones, you often get underflows, which is why you guys need to know about log probabilities. Log probabilities don't have too much semantics, except they're just taking the log of a calculation. Why would you just take a log of a calculation? Well, you might just end up with something that a computer could represent. So for example, if you told me the answer not to this expression, but log of this expression, I would still be able to tell you who wrote the document. I'd be able to look at this number and reason about whether or not it was Hamilton or Madison, if you gave me the log of this ratio. And the nice thing about this is, then you would do the log of these two sides. And when you do the log of these two sides, you actually get something nice. First, you get the log of this, minus the log of this instead of division because divisions just become subtraction. And when you do the log of this product, it's like the log is a big old tractor. It's gonna bulldoze right through 
that product system, and when it bulldozes, it just leaves you with a beautiful sum, and the log just goes right inside as a tractor. The log of a product is the sum of logs, as you guys know. Um, so HI to the power of CI minus the sum of the log of MI to the power of CI. So that's what happens when you do a log to this term. All those products become additions and this division becomes a subtraction. It's a little bit better than that. You know, the log of something raised to a power is just the log of that thing times by the power. And we have ourselves a very nice expression. So if you took the log of this term, you can get something that you would compute in a different way. It's a lot of additions of small numbers, logs of small numbers, and hopefully it doesn't lead to an underflow. We're gonna then get an answer which isn't the ratio, but rather the log of the ratio. We'll have to do a little bit more work to interpret it. So let's go over to code that does that. Exact same code, but instead of calculating the probability, I'm gonna calculate the log probability. So instead of starting with one, I'm gonna start with the log of one, and then I'm going to do this sum. Loop over every word, get the probability of the word, do the log of that probability, and multiply it by how many times the word shows up. So a nice one, two, three, four, five line program. If we do this, we're gonna get log terms on the top and log terms on the bottom. Who wants to see what happens? Log predict. What? Okay, back up, Chris. Okay, um, instead of talking the probability of D given H, we no longer have zeros. We have these big negative numbers. And so the log of the probability of the document given Hamilton is this negative 14,000, and the log of the probability of the document given Madison is this negative 13,000. If you subtract those two terms, you'll get the log of this ratio. And if you subtracted those two terms, you get negative 1,353. So this log of this uh, ratio of probabilities is negative 1,300 about. Who wrote the document? Madison. What? How do they know it's Madison? Okay, how does that tell me the answer to this? If it wasn't a log, if Madison wrote this, let's say Madison was the actual author. If Madison was the actual author, the probability Madison given document should be greater than the probability of Hamilton given document. Do you guys agree? So if Madison's truly the author, this should be a number less than one because it's a smaller number divided by a bigger number. It should be something like uh, 0 0.2 or something like that. You know, that would be that Madison, um, is much more likely than Hamilton to have written it. If this ratio, if Hamilton wrote it, then this ratio should be greater than one. This number should be bigger. Beautiful thing about logs that you need to know. Can I tell you? I would love to tell you this beautiful thing about logs. Okay, a little bit of review. Here's a graph of the log function. And notice at log of one, something special happens. If you put a number that's bigger than one into a log, you get a positive. And if you put a number between zero and one into a log, you get a negative. So if you put in zero, log of 0 0.2, you'll get a negative number. If you put in log of five, you'll get a positive number. Since this is a leg, negative number, I know that this ratio must be less than one. Let me just show you that really quickly so that you believe me. So Python uh, import math, math.log of, Say we put in a number greater than one, like three, you get a positive. Let's say we put in something like 0 0.5, that's less than one, you get a negative. So anytime you see a negative expression from a log, you know that something less than one went in there, which means I know Madison wrote that. Um, and like if you put in a really small number, you get a larger negative. If you put in a really, really small number, you get a much larger negative. This negative 13,000, like, what do I have to put in here to get the log to be 13,000? A lot. Our model is very, very confident that Madison wrote it. It's not like Madison wrote it. It's like, Madison definitely wrote this thing. Hamilton's a liar. Okay, question. Yes, 
you can certainly take advantage of the fact that um, you know log base e of some number, so like k, uh, is do, 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 saying that equals, let's say, n, is the same as claiming that e to the power of n equals k. You could take advantage of this and turn and actually calculate this exact number. Totally two reasonable approaches. Okay, now we know. Madison wrote it. Can we take a step back and think about what we were supposed to have learned? So first of all, we used a multinomial to come up with this probability of the document knowing who the author was. It used the counts of words, it, a lot of things canceled out, and it led to a really nice expression for how likely is a document given the author. We use Bayes' theorem with a multinomial, and it's a warm up to the idea that Bayes' theorem can show up in lots of places. And then you saw this super important concept, which is that in computer science, if you're doing a probability that involves a lot of products with small numbers, you might get underflow, and your solution to that is to use this thing called a log probability. It's just put a log in front of it. It's a different representation of the concept you're trying to calculate. A lot of things in one cool example, and there's a question in the back. succinctly, I guess, how the left-hand side of the board relates to the right side of the board. So the left board on your left. Oh, on this one. Yeah. So this is how, you know, a straightforward way to figure out if Hamilton wrote this document is to calculate this expression. But this expression has this term, which is easy, this term, which is trivial, and this term, which is insanely hard. Now, one thing we sometimes do is we take this bottom term and we turn it into the law of total probability. You do something like the probability of D given H times the probability of H plus the probability of D given Madison times the probability of Madison. Anyone ever done something like this? Yes, okay, good. <laughs> um, you could have done this. But if you approach, I, I gave you a different way to get rid of the probability of D, which was I was going to give you the ratio of Hamilton to Madison. Can I tell you, Cheeky, why I didn't do it this way? If I tried to do it this way, when I apply my log, this will be straightforward, this will be straightforward, and this addition here is gonna be a total disaster. Because the log of A plus B doesn't turn into a nice expression. Uh, it becomes quite hard to express. You'd actually have to calculate some of these probabilities on their own. It's really, really hard to simplify this expression if you went straight to a log of this probability. Like if you try and do log of Hamilton given document, whew, difficult. Possible, but difficult. Um, I used this trick, got rid of the D, and then when I did the log, everything was very nice because I didn't have this awful summation in the, in the normalizing constant. So actually, that is another big takeaway, is that this normalization constant is a huge problem for Bayes' theorem, and you now know two tricks for dealing with it. You can expand using the law of total probability, or you can do this ratio and get it to cancel out. Yes? Yeah, absolutely. There's lots of, you know, these priors, your belief before you see data, it's a lot of scholastic argumentation. Be like, I think that our belief before we see data should be like 0.8 that it's Hamilton because he wrote more papers. Um, it turns out the, the multinomial is so convinced that even if you brought in different priors, it gets totally overwhelmed by the evidence and it gets washed out. So it turns out it didn't really matter what your prior belief was. Unless you say like, I'm 99.99999% positive it's Hamilton before you start your calculations, it's going to lead to Madison being the author. Now, it would have been fine here. You would have just ended up with, you know, log of this would have been plus log of probability of H. And this would have been, you know, minus this, which is log of probability of Madison. Like the, all the calculations would have worked out quite nicely. Okay. Fantastic. Wooch, I feel like that summarizes the mood at this moment. It's like, yeah, we can do it. What a cool thing to be able to do at this point in CS109. Okay. I want to go back to a claim. Oh, there's a bunch of things we, we want to be able to do um, with, uh, with probabilistic models. So now you can kind of use a joint, and I want us to get to start thinking about conditional probabilities 
with joint variables. Does that sound good? I want us to get a little bit more formal about if you have a model, what does conditioning mean? This is inference. It's one of the most important things you can learn in the whole field of probability. Inference really says this conditional probability uh, with joint variables in a model says, I have a model of how the world works. I observe from information and now my model will change. And thinking about how your model will change when you condition on things you observe, that's one of the be alls and end alls of why we study this whole field. So let's learn how to do it. And let's go back to our friends who are living with roommates or in two room doubles, shared partners, CS109 from years past. The joint probability table tells you everything you need to solve conditional probability questions, but let's go ahead and try solving some of them. So here's a joint probability of what room people were in and what year they were. You guys ready to go to the internet? Let's go to the internet. Okay. I have here your joint table. It says, like, what does this cell mean? This says, like, what's the chance that somebody's both a junior and has a roommate? I now want us to bump up our utility and start using this joint to solve conditional probability questions. And I'm gonna challenge you guys with one. I'm gonna challenge you with, I'm gonna tell you the value of this random variable. I'm gonna tell you that this random variable is equal to sophomore. Their, or actually let's do junior. Their year is a junior. So I tell you that their year is a junior. What's your new belief in their room situation? And how could you calculate it? If you wanna make this simpler, just start with one value. If I tell you that somebody's a junior, what's your updated belief that they have roommates? You can solve this from first principles where we're going to generalize this though we can bring it to the world of probabilistic models, but this is where it starts. Take a moment, talk to the person next to you, see if you can figure out what's the probability that somebody is in a roommate situation given they're a junior. And then we'll see if we can write this in here. Oh man, what do we do here? Okay, you know it, you might see this and think, what these are conditional probabilities in the world of random variables. I've only seen conditional probabilities in the world of events. But in fact, this is an event. This is the event where the roommate situation is that you have roommates, or the housing situation that you have roommates. And this is the event where your year in school is a junior. And if you think of these as events, you can do any of the conditional probability work that you've learned in this class. And really when you have conditional probability, there's two ways you can approach it. You can just think about the definition of conditional probability, or you can use Bayes' theorem, man, that thing that shows up like a billion times in CS109. And CS109 could be renamed to be like the class where you use Bayes' theorem like every third problem. <laughs> because it's that useful. Bayes' theorem would say that, you know, this probability, well, actually, I suppose, wait, I, I have to forgive myself. This is a situation where actually the definition of conditional probability is just fine. <laughs> Oops. 
OK, what is the definition of conditional probability? It says that this is equal to these two events together. So I'm just do r equals little r for roommates, or I'll say room for roommates, and y equals junior. Embarrassing, I said base theorem, but I actually meant the definition of conditional probability. I have to like forgive myself tonight. <laughs> and this is it. So it would say that the probability of this happening is the probability of them both happening at the same time divided by just the overall probability that somebody's a junior, not taking into account what room they're in. So what's the probability of these two things happening at the same time? R roommates and they're a junior. Yeah, it's 0 0.04. You know, the joint probability table <coughs> gives you the probability of the and of any combination of random variables. And now you're wondering, do I actually have the probability <coughs> that somebody is a junior? Yeah, that's the marginal. It's this. It's 0 0.175. And so, oh, nicely done, Google. Building that in for me. <laughs> it tells me that the probability that somebody is a junior, or that their roommate situation, given that they're a junior, is 0 0.227. Wait. Given year. Yeah, yeah. No, I got that right. OK. Now, if we want to know the probability somebody's in a two-room double given that they're a junior, what is this going to look like now? It's going to be the same thing, just room's going to be two-room double. So the probability somebody's a two-room double given that they're a junior is going to be that fraction. The probability that somebody is a, a shared partner given that they're in a two-room double. I guess shared partner is like you live with a couple situation. Uh, and nobody reported that anonymous survey. Um, <laughs> But a lot of people have singles. So you know, if you look at the overall distribution, the belief in what room situations people have, very few people have singles. But if you condition on the fact that people are juniors, it increases by quite a lot. <coughs> if I sum up all of these things, stop being to, trying to be so intelligent. It all gives me one. So that's the probability that somebody's roommate given they're junior, plus the probability somebody's two room double given that they're a junior, plus probably a shared partner given junior, plus a probably of single given junior, all of that adds up to one. Because these four rooms span the space. So if you enter the world where somebody's a junior, they live in one of these four living situations. Now, let's do the same thing with freshmen. But this, in, this time, instead of using the marginal, I'm going to do something slightly different. I'm still calculating the same probability. So that probably somebody is a freshman and has roommates. But in this time, instead of using the marginal, I'm going to use the definition of the marginal, which is the sum of this row. And this is the law of total probability. It is expanding this using the law of total probability. It's like junior and, or sorry, freshman and roommates plus freshman and two room doubles plus freshman and shared partners plus freshman and signal. And that's what the law of total probability is saying. That's where the marginal comes from. Um, anyways, and so you could fill in this whole table. Do, 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 do. So that equals this divided by that number. This equals that divided by this number. And single equals this divided by A. So this is very interesting. If you think about the probability mass function over rooms, if you don't condition on what your people are, this is what the probability mass function says. For any assignment to rooms, it gives you a probability. If you condition on them being a freshman, it changes. If you condition on them being a junior, it changes. And that's such a simple way of communicating what inference is. When you tell me some information, like what year somebody is, you watch the whole probability distribution of another random variable change. I think this is easier to see as a chart. OK. Here is the idea as a chart. This is the probability distribution of rooms if you didn't tell me what year somebody was in CS109. Most people have roommates. Some people have singles. This is a whole probability mass function. Do you guys buy that? Now we infer, now we, we observe that somebody's a junior, and we infer a whole new probability mass function. The probability mass function changes quite a lot. All of these likelihoods change once you tell me they're a junior. And look, probability of somebody being a single skyrockets. People are much more likely to have a single uh, in their junior year of college. And that's a simple idea. We're going to do this. We're going to do it for more and more interesting models. We're going to take a belief in a random variable. 
we're going to observe some information and we're going to watch the belief in that random variable change. And sometimes we'll use the definition of conditional probability and sometimes we'll use Bayes' theorem to solve for that. Okay. Just for a little bit of like uh, levity, I've got a whole bunch of these data sets for CS109 and I can show you how these distributions change over time. Here I'm showing you those distributions changing as people go from freshmen to sophomores to juniors to seniors. Look what happens to roommates. Yeah, we're a lot less likely to have roommates. You're more likely to be in a single room as a junior than as a five plus, which is, seems a little unfair. That's one data set. Here's another one that I collected one year. Um, this is how people get to class. Uh, and you can imagine a lot of people bike to class, especially sophomores, all about the eco travel. Uh, but then, you know, seniors are all about like, I don't, I've got so much time to ponder the complexities of life that I'm just gonna walk. Uh, <laughs> this one is very noisy, but this is where people were eating as you conditioned on different years at Stanford. So if you condition on somebody being a sophomore, they're very likely eating at a dining hall, but like grad students are like, I'm never touching that food. Well, not never, uh, but less likely. Um, eating clubs might not exist anymore. We used to like be friends and eat together and like small groups. What a time is wild, pre-pandemic. Uh, and then people are more likely to make their own food over time. <laughs> Uh, and then, you know, we had that data set the other uh, day in class, and you can see, like, what's the relationship status over a year, uh, year, and you can see, like, uh, people are, really don't couple up, but then all of a sudden, like, senior year comes, and they're like, I'm out of time, or something, I don't know. <laughs> okay, also for a little levity, because you guys are learning some complicated stuff, I very much appreciate that. Let's play a little game. A little, ga little game is called number or function. So if I have two random variables, x and y, and I ask the question, what's the probability of x equals two given that y equals five, is that a number or a function? Think about it, think about it, think about it. Now yell it out loud. Number. Yay, cool game. <laughs> okay, ooh, here's one. What's the probability that x takes on the value little x given that y takes on the value two? Okay. Yeah, it's a function, and also it's a random variable. It's saying like, what is the probability mass function of my random variable in the world where I observe this thing about another random variable. And that probability mass function is a function. You can represent as a 1D table, you can represent it as a Python function, but it is a function. Okay, very good. Okay, think about it. Think about it. Think about it. Yell it out loud. Function. Ooh, but what? It's a 2D function where you put in both the thing you're conditioning on and the outcome, those are the two inputs to the function, uh, and it gives you back a number. And in fact, if we went back here, if we filled this whole thing in, this is what a 2D function looks like. For any assignment to roommates and frosh, it can produce a number. Okay, let's take our pedagogical pause, have two minutes, think about life, and we will come back to this idea of inference and we'll take it up a notch. Okay, take two minutes.
Okay, let's bring it together. And while, while we're coming back, I'll tell you guys something totally unimportant. So fatherhood is this like exciting experience. And one of the exciting experiences is like you get to define like what the universe looks like to another human being is a totally wild thing. And mostly I've just been like giving her the honest, like this is what the world is like. Um, except for, I'm trying to convince her that when people ask you how are you, you just say groovy or feeling groovy, like that's the appropriate response. I'm trying to like not tell her about like, oh, I'm good, I'm happy, it's just always groovy, which is not that important. I hope you guys though are feeling groovy after that pedagogical loss. <laughs> okay, so. Bayes' theorem revisited, you know, you've seen this before, we've just used it to figure out who wrote that particular document, and I just want to write it out again, and I want to take a moment to name the terms. So if you have Bayes' theorem, there are names to each of these terms. Notice how this term and this term both have the probability of B. And I really think about Bayes' theorem as taking a prior belief and calculating what we call an updated belief, or if you're really fancy, a posterior belief. So this is the belief before you see the evidence, and this is the belief after you saw the evidence. And I really think of Bayes' theorem as a function that takes a belief and updates it using evidence. It has these two other terms. You have to know how likely is the evidence given a particular assignment to the belief, and it has this other term that we now know to dread, the normalization constant. And normalization constant is a pretty boring name compared to these other three, like posterior, likelihood of evidence, prior belief, all very semantic, normalization constants, not. And we really do think about this as just something that we need to calculate if we want to get our probability. So now we have names for those things. What a nice thing. And I just want to remind us of what we've stated, but I just want to say it again. Bayes' theorem with random variables works just like you imagine. It's the exact same thing as events. In this case, our events are just going to be assignments to random variables. So this is the event where, let's say, m is a discrete random variable. This is the event where n, a discrete random variable, takes on the value 3. And Bayes' theorem, if you just treat this as e and this is f, you would just get plug right into your Bayes' theorem formula. Question? Yes. Would you mind going back to the last slide? Not at all. Um, so what has always confused me a little bit about Bayes' theorem is that I think there's two ways of doing it. I think last time we did it with the table as the probability of something and something over the probability of the second thing happening. And then there's this other option, and I don't often know which one to choose. Yes, so it's a good point. In the last problem, there's a couple ways of expressing this numerator and a couple ways of expressing this denominator. In this last problem, you know what I did is I actually, in this numerator, had e and b. Instead of doing e given b times probability of b, I just had probability of e comma b. That, if you wrote it out like that, technically it would be the definition of conditional probability. So you could, instead of writing that top term or calculating that top term, you could have calculated this. That's the likelihood of both the events happening at the same time. Or if you're in the world of random variables, what we call the joint probability of those two assignments. There's two ways of thinking about this. Just like we have one formula that's just this over that, and another formula which is this over that. Obviously, that makes those two things equal. And actually, if you thought about the chain rule, the chain rule says that this times this equals that. So if you take, what's the likelihood of b to happen? What's the likelihood of e given b? You multiply those two things together, you get a chance of E and B happening. So you have that option. Okay. Yes? Sorry. How does mutual exclusivity play into that? Do you have to choose one if the events are mutually exclusive and another if they're not? No, it doesn't matter. Neither independence nor mutual exclusivity matters. These apply to any pairs of events. Okay. For any two pairs of events, Bayes' rule applies. Um, and you can use either. It just has to do with information was given to you. Like in the last problem, the table had this information, so this was a convenient form. In the Hamilton problem, we didn't have this, but we had the condition, like probability of words given the author, and then we had a belief about the author. So we, we were given information in these two expressions. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, this is the point. Yeah, so then that means the joint probability of E and B is basically the enumerator of the bias. A, a, a numerator of the... I say like when you have e given b and e, uh, e given b, no? So e given b, mm -hmm. uh, and what, what was the other one? So, um, so the likelihood of evidence, 
Yes. Yes. Never refer, especially equal to the joint probability of the evidence. Exactly. Exactly. The, if you multiply the probability of evidence with your prior, you get the joint probability of the prior and the evidence together. Exactly. What a nice way of putting it. Okay. So. We're bumping this up, and it's not too big a leap, but I don't want to lose anybody on this leap. When we go to the world of random variables, it's the same Bayes theorem, it's just our events are made with assignments to random variables. If I give you a concrete statement like this, I think a lot of people follow me. I think where I could lose a lot of people is when I change it to something like this, where instead of writing concrete numbers with events we can imagine, I use symbols. So like. The probability that m takes on the value little m, and the probability n takes on the value little n, and I just put in a variable assignment. This is true, it's just using a lot more symbols in its notation. So it's the exact same thing. Uh, these are all events. I'm just trying to write a bunch of statements with concrete numbers all in one expression. So whenever you see something like this, feel free to slow me down and be like, whoa, 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 Chris, what do you mean when you say probably that m takes on the value little m? Okay, and I want to remind us of the shorthand I talked about at the beginning of class. This becomes very clunky to write, and a lot of times you'll see things like this. So the probability of little m given n implies this bigger expression. So it implies that there is a random variable with the capital taking on this value. There's a random variable with capital N taking on this value, but just it's so much easier to write and almost easier to see that people love this notation. So if you read a paper, you'll almost always see this shorthand notation. <laughs> Okay, let's try a real problem. So when babies are born, they can't tell you whether or not they hear things. So they do this test to see whether or not babies can hear, where they'll play a sound, and then they'll watch if babies actually change their gaze. And it's a totally uh, stochastic experience. Sometimes babies just look different directions for unrelated reasons, uh, and there has to be a lot of reasoning under uncertainty to try and infer, is this baby hearing given how they change their gaze. So I'm gonna give you a lot of information about a joint relationship of two random variables. The two random variables that are interesting here are whether or not the baby changes their gaze and how much they do, so it's a random variable which can take on values. And there's another random variable, and this one is going to be Bernoulli. It's either true or false, and it's whether or not the baby can hear the sound. I'm gonna call that one y equals one just so we can enter the world of using random variables. So we're gonna observe x equals zero, and we wanna calculate what's the probability of y equaling one given that x equals zero. Now, interestingly here, the information I give you is a conditional probability table. Here I give you the probability of x given that y equals one. That's this column. And here's the probability of x given that y equals zero. In order to solve any conditional probability question, you want to have the joint distribution, but you want to know something crazy? I've actually given you the joint because I've given you the probability equals y equals one, I've given you the probability y equals zero, that's just one over four, and then the probability of x given y, if you multiply the probability of x given y times the probability of y, you've got the joint. But that's not that important right now. What is important right now is I'm going to want to calculate the probability of y equals one um, so that the baby can hear the sound given that x equals zero. And take a moment with that person next to you, see if you can figure out how are you gonna get probability of y equals one given x equals zero with the information that we've got. And so this is a way to practice what we've been talking about with Bayes' theorem.
Okay. It's asking a conditional probability question. So we've talked about how that's often going to give you an expression that looks like this. At the top, you might have this product of two different probabilities, the prior and the likelihood of the evidence given the belief. Or if you're given different information, this might be as e better to represent just using the joint probability of x equals 0 and y equals 1. Two options there. But the problem really pushes you towards one of them. And the reason the problem pushes you towards one of them is that we are given x given y equals 1 and x given y equals 0. So we're given x in the context where y equals 1. That's the left-hand side. And we've got x where y equals 0. So because the information is given to us in this format, it's a nice place to start. So what's the probability that x equals 0 given y equals 1? This seems like something we could just look up. 0 0.08. 0 0.08. It's that top thing in the row. It says, you know, if y equals 1, probably x equals 0 is just this number. What is the probability that y equals 1, your belief before you walk into the experiment? Yeah, 0 0.75. And, you know, that hopefully came from some informed belief uh, and somebody didn't just make up that number. Though there's this whole debate in probability about, like, some people, this just, like, turn some people in the mathematical world insane because they're like, how'd you get that prior? And people get like really up in arms about it. But that's not important right now. What is important is this normalization constant. What are we going to do with this normalization constant? Question. Just because it's 0.75, could we have found that adding up this column as well, or is it actually a different number? If you add up this column, you should get one, if I did everything right. Four, five, six, seven, yeah, I think eight, 9, 10, this all adds up to 1. And that makes sense because if you enter the world where the baby can hear, then you should see one of these values. If you enter the world where the baby can't hear, you should see one of these values. You get a full probability mass function. So it's a good question. So this doesn't keep any information about the prior. The prior has to be given externally. Yeah, yeah. But in, if it was a joint, the probability of the prior would have been inside of it. So this is not a joint table. This is a conditional probability table. So we don't, we were given the probability of one random variable conditioned on the other. Like it's, when we go back here, remember there was these two tables. This is the joint table. And then we started calculating this conditional table. We've been given a conditional table here. Okay, somebody help us. What are we going to do about this normalization constant? Just forget about it. We could calculate the probability of, um, y equals 0 given x equals 0 and then try and divide it. We could do that, but we don't need to do that here. There is an easier way. Yes? Law of total probability. Law of total probability. But what, you know, we've kind of got this classic probability that x equals 0 given y equals 1 times the probability that y equals 1 plus the probability that x equals 0 given y equals 0 times the probability that y equals 0. You know, if you just thought of these as the world of events, this is your classic version of Bayes that you've used a whole bunch in your homework. And then again, we know this term, 0 0.08. We know this term, 0 0.75. We know this term, it's 0 0.25. And probably the y equals 0, x equals 0, given the y equals 0, is just 0 0.4. And this would just become, you know, 0 0.4 times 0 0.25. And this would be 0 0.08 times 0 0.75. And we have numbers for every term, so we could just calculate it. Um, here it is written up into slides. You know, we just wanted to do basically a straight Bayes. And the challenge of this problem was mostly just understanding that information was given to you as this conditional probability table. So we have a whole random variable in the world where y equals 1 and a whole random variable in the world where y equals 0. With, once you realize what information you've got, you just plug it in, chug, and it, you get your updated belief of 3 over 8 that the baby can hear. And that's quite interesting, you know, like, you saw an experiment, it gave you results, and the results might have just led somebody to conclude that the baby can't hear because they didn't respond. But because there's so much noise in this experiment, there's so much stochasticity to how babies respond, you're actually not that confident after you've just seen one observation. Question. Uh, so let's say you instead observed x equals 5. How would you know if you were supposed to use the calculus in the first row or the second? Oh, yeah, this is a little bit poorly defined. You know, hopefully somebody tells you if this is, like, inclusive or exclusive. Very good question. So, like, so hopefully somebody did a better job of writing this table. 
But also, you'll never see exactly 5. It'll be like 4.99999 or 5.00000001 or larger. But that's such a cop-out answer. <laughs> Good question. Okay, yes. So, the fact that it's a range from 0 to 5, should that have an impact on our answer? No. Uh, yeah, this is interesting. You know, technically this probably should be a continuous random variable, and we'll get to that later. I'll have a continuous version of this. But here I did kind of a hacky discretization. I took my continuous space and I binned it. Um, and people do that, and normally when it's binned, you just treat everything in a bin as one. Okay, good question. You guys, one last thing I want us to do. I want us to mix some discrete and continuous. I have a super interesting problem that's going to make us think about continuous random variables. It kind of speaks to the question that was just asked. What would you do if this wasn't a discrete random variable? How would you treat it if your random variable was, say, a Gaussian? So without trying to gender elephants, I'm going to do this problem. It turns out that girl elephants, uh, or female elephants and male elephants at birth have different distributions of weights. Uh, and these are actually real distributions. So uh, male, girl, female elephants are 160 kilograms with this standard deviation, and male elephants are 165 kilograms well, heavy with this standard deviation. And just to practice, this is not the most interesting problem, but I thought it was one that could help us practice updating a continuous belief given information. Or, sorry, updating a, a belief given continuous information. Here we want to say, all you know about a newborn elephant is its weight. You're told that's 163 kilograms. And now I want you to change your belief about whether or not it's a boy or a girl. Your prior belief is that it's one half, one half. But your posterior belief will be something different, and it's going to require us to think about the world of discrete random variables and continuous together. Let me just define some things that are said in this problem. There's two random variables. G is going to be about whether or not the uh, elephant is a girl, and G is a Bernoulli with probability 0.5. It's one half probability prior. X is the distribution of the weight of the elephants. If you tell me g equals 1, I know x is this normal distribution. If you tell me g equals 0, I know x is this distribution. And, you know, maybe you take this and you start writing out your Bayes theorem. You're like, this problem says I want to know the probability of g equals 1, or g 1 for girl, given that x equals 163. And you get probability of g equals 1 given x equals 163. And it seems so straightforward. It seems like everything's going to be just fine. And I promise it'll be just fine. Um, so you've got probably x equals 163, given that g equals 1, times the probability that g equals 1, divided by the probability that x equals 163. And you can you know, figure out that normalization constant. This feels fine. Until you get to this expression, if I tell you that an elephant is a female, what's the probability that its weight is exactly 163? Zero. Because for continuous random variables, we think about 163.000000000 with infinite precision as being an event that never happens. And so what started as a simple problem now seems terrifying. But let me give you an aside that's going to make this not so terrifying. Um, sorry. Well, we have joint distributions. We have this goal of inference. Remember at the beginning of class, I gave us this insight. Sure, for a continuous random variable, the probability that it takes on a value is zero. But a calculus way of interpreting that zero is it is the density, so the derivative, times an epsilon. Since that epsilon is basically zero, you can think of this as zero, or the calculus way allows you to add in an epsilon. What that means is, instead of having this probability here, I can put in an epsilon, not times the probability, but pro times the probability density. And this seems fine, but then you get an answer with an epsilon in it. What the hell does that mean? Until you don't give up, and you get to this part, and you're like, this probability, it's the probability that an elephant is a, exactly 163. Again, you have a continuous random variable. And again, you have something that should be a zero. And we're dividing by zero, naughty us. But again, you're like, this probability, we can represent it as an epsilon times the density. 
To put that more precisely, let's say you have a discrete and a continuous random variable. This continuous random variable probability of an exact assignment can be thought of as a density times epsilon. And you have an exact assignment on both the numerator and the denominator. And then a beautiful, beautiful thing happens when you write it out like this. Your epsilons cancel. And a little tear comes to your eye because you're like, I didn't know what to do with those epsilons, but they just went away. I wish every problem in life could be that easy. And when they just go away, you're left with this new version of Bayes. You guys now have a brand new version of Bayes. Welcome to the class, new version of Bayes. It looks just like your Bayes theorem. But whenever you have a continuous random variable on the left side, instead of using the probability mass function, you're using the probability density function. And this is the missing information that we needed in order to solve our elephant problem. So there's a bunch of versions of Bayes where you mix discrete and continuous, but the long story short is in all of them, anytime you have a continuous on the left, you use probability density. Um, and so here, you know, if you have a continuous random variable, my x and y's are continuous, you use density. Anytime you have continuous, you use density. Every time you have discrete, you use the probability mass function. And it all works out because of those epsilon canceling. So you can derive each of these independently. Okay. Going back to my elephant, I want to think about this again. So these epsilons are gone. Life seems pretty good. But we still need to solve the problem and we're not done. The first thing I want to think about is how do we want to expand this lower term? And I'm going to say we can use the law of total probability. And actually, uh, the slide in the aside that I skipped is the law of total probability also has this uh, function where you know, if n is discrete and x is continuous, then you can just use the probability density in place of the probability. And again, you could use an epsilon to derive this if you wanted to. So here, this is equal to the probability density times your prior divided by, we have to expand this term, and I'm going to use the law of total probability. So f of x equals 163, given that g equals 1, times the probability g equals 1, plus the density of 163, given g equals 0, so it's a boy, times the prior probability that g equals 0. And here you have just your standard Bayes. It's just any time you had a continuous random variable, you use density instead of probabilities. OK, what's the probability that g equals 1? 1 half. Yeah, so this is just going to be 1 half. This is 1 half, and this is 1 half. All those terms cancel out. And we're just left with these three terms. And you're like, oh, great, three simple terms. What are we going to do? What is this? It's the probability density at 163 in the world where the gender is female. Well, in the world where gender is female, x is given by this normal distribution. And if this is the normal distribution, what's the probability density at 163? If only we had a probability density formula, which we do have. We have a probability density formula. We know the likelihood of a normal distribution taking on a particular value. So if this normal distribution has a particular mean and particular variance, which we know, we can ask what's the likelihood of it taking on value 163. We're just going to be plugging in that bad boy in for this, or girl because g equals 1, putting it over there for this one. And then here it's the same thing. It's just we've got the distribution for whether or not it's a male. And so the probability density function of the normal comes in to save the day. I appreciate this is a very hard thing to do. You guys worked very hard to follow a lot of complicated ideas. But the power that it will lead to is worth it. It's going to allow us to solve very interesting problems if you can master the skill of inference. We've practiced on some shorter problems. We're going to finish our practice. But I have a sweet promise for you guys on Monday. Come back on Monday. We're going to use this exact same mathematics not to solve a toy problem, but to solve a real problem. As you guys know, the Stanford Acuity test was invented here in CS109. It does an eye test where you keep track of your belief distribution of what a person can see, and it keeps updating with new evidence. It's the world's most accurate eye test, and we will take this math and we'll make something real. Come back on Monday. Have a fantastic weekend. See you guys, CS109. <laughs> Sorry for all the yelling. <laughs>